Um, thank you, Crystal. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Kate Koimoku. I'm a multidisciplinary artist, teacher, and recent board member for WEED, uh, Women in Environmental Arts Dialogue. Um, and I'm really happy here to talk about one of my favorite things, which is trash. <laughs> um, I love trash. I love making work with trash. Um, I think bringing a lot of um, more awareness to trash and how we use trash um, is really important to me. So I am going to go forward with um, my work here. Let's see, let's pull this up real quick. Okay. Um, so my art and the way that I deal with trash, um, I've been dealing with trash for, I think it's like probably over two decades now. Um, but my first art piece that I ever made um, using uh, recyclable materials um, was in Rome when I was studying um, in my undergrad. Um, my project was, it was an untitled piece, but I collected by myself over 300 uh, plastic bottles in about six weeks. And I created um, a 25 foot tall uh, plastic bottle, like light installation. Um, and so this was something that I didn't realize had such a like logical like impact, but in Rome during that time in 2009, um, there was no recycling and there was no like compost or anything like that. And that was something coming from like Seattle or the Bay Area, um, which is something that's really important, which is recycling. Um, I thought it was something really important to show the people of Rome. And so this is one of my first pieces that I ever made. Um, the second one here in the middle, standing room only, um, or SRO, uh, was something that I made right after uh, I completed my undergrad and moved to the Bay Area. Um, I started working in art support services um, as a fine art framer. Um, and what I found is that being a framer, um, wor working in like basically a very high waste industry where there's such this high level of perfection that needs to happen for your artwork and taking care of artwork um, that artists and museums and galleries use, there's actually ends up being a lot of waste. And so what I ended up doing is just during my time as being a framer is collected all these beautiful wood moldings and I created these like standing public structures in which people could walk into and basically reframed um, the way that we look at these, these pieces and these works. Um, the third piece that I made here was more so recently is called Ho'ua, which is, means uh, make it rain in Hawaiian. Um, and it is a large bingo wheel that is, has filled with ping pong balls. Um, I decided to make, I wanted to make this kind of rain, rainwater kind of, uh, project installation. And the sound of it, actually, when you turn it, sounds like uh, rain falling on, on a tin roof or something like that. Um, so just me collecting these ping pong balls, I went to one place and it was an old um, ping pong bar. Uh, and I was able to collect all 3,000, over 3,000 ping pong balls in three weeks. Um, I know it doesn't look like too much here, but Believe me, it, it makes a very large sound. Um, but I, I'm always been very interested in like, I'm kind of, it was, in this case, it was a little appalling to know that like this ping pong club was throwing away over 3000 ping pong balls just because they had slight defects or punctures or things like that. I think I could have probably filled the whole thing if I had collected a little bit more or if they would have given me more. Um, but I thought that was a pretty good amount for um, the small period. I collected these in uh, about a month. Um, as I continued to start, um, I think this was at the beginning of uh, Shelter in Place um, in the beginning of 2020. Um, I started working with more like furniture design um, and 
what I found is that I kept finding all these like big blocks of styrofoam. And so I started re researching a lot about styrofoam and, you know, all these other single use plastics and, you know, EPS, um, expanded polystyrene. Um, and I was trying to figure out ways that I could use them to make things that were multi-use. So I started thinking about as this during this time during COVID thinking about, um, how we sit in different ways, what we're doing. We have all this time. So I decided to make something that was multi-purpose. So, and that's kind of where my continued practice is going forward is continuing to think about ways that we can use these single use plastics or a single use trash, post-consumer trash um, and how we can use those for multiple use. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do in for the rest of this uh, presentation is I'm gonna talk more about other artists who use post-consumer trash or use trash and performance. And I'm going to draw connections between consumption, waste and the environment. So I'm gonna start this talk um, with kind of a prolific in my, in my opinion, um, artist who deals with trash, um, Meryl Laterman Ukeles. Um, Meryl was uh, one of the first, or was the first um, artist in residence for um, New York City's um, mun public municipal waste um, program. Um, when she was working there, she, uh, she I think she, had over 25 different like art pieces that she created. Um, the first one uh, is called, I make maintenance art one hour every day. And when she posed this question to all the maintenance workers to basically take one hour each day in which they reframed their work as a sanitation worker as performance. Um, I thought this was a really interesting way um, and something that we could take away very easily with what we do with our work and knowing that like whatever we do, it's like we are artisans, we are performance people. And this is like a really interesting way I thought about dealing with trash. Um, the next one that she, the next piece that I'm gonna talk about is called Touch Sanitation. Um, in this way, um, she deals in waste in a totally different way than maybe like using post-consumer consumer waste um, in which she single-handedly um, thanked and shook hands with every single um, sanitation worker. Um, I think it was between, oh yeah, it was over 8,500 New York City sanitation workers and every single one of them from all 59 community districts. Um, I think this took her probably about, I think it took over three months for her to complete it between 1979 and 1980. Um, she also had another piece, which she called the social mirror, which is in 1983, which she took a 20 foot long mirror and put it on the side of one of the waste trucks, basically creating just this, um, this huge mirror and um, for people to basically see themselves and the way that they associate with trash. I think that um, with a lot of trash and the way that we deal with trash, um, especially in the US, it's kind of, you know, we take trash and, you know, we buy, we consume, and then, you know, and then we set and forget, you know. Um, so I think that this really uh, creates kind of a, a great dynamic. And I, I actually really wish a lot of the garbage trucks had something like this on them right now. <laughs> Um, another piece that uh, Meryl was involved with was Turnaround Sound. Um, and this was actually on, I think this is a little fuzzy photo, but um, so this was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it's an old uh, landfill. And as you can see over on the right, it, they covered the landfill to basically create uh, more of a public art space. And so Meryl worked with the architects to basically put this, um, this dance floor, which she called turnaround sound or this gathering spot. And it's made out of glass vault. So the galaxy figure that you see is actually a combination of glass mirror and asphalt. Um, so this was the first time that glass vault was actually been used in Massachusetts. I believe the first, first time it was ever used was in New York. Um, and basically they were able to, during the construction of this project, they were able to get um, between, I think it was 
10,000 tons of glass and mirror donated by, um, by the city of Cambridge. Um, and then there was another um, company, the Spectrum Glass Company that donated 20, um, 20 tons of glass. So it was 22 tons of glass in total to create this beautiful um, galaxy glass vault path. Um, if you're interested in looking at more of glass vaults or the purposes for it, there's actually a manifesto of glass vaults. Um, it's called the Glass Vault Paving Handbook, um, came out in 1989. Um, Unfortunately, there, even though there are no like, there's no physical limitations on using glass vault, um, because of the aggregate size, it's hard to use for, for pavements and highways, uh, for pavements in highways that are 65 miles per hour plus. Um, but um, there, uh, there's people who are using them contemporarily to fill potholes and things of that nature, which I think is a really great way um, to use this um, the next artist I'm going to talk about is Vic Munez. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about his, um, his wasteland work in the next slide. Um, but Vic is, um, Vic is a portrait artist and uh, he used a lot of, he uses a lot of garbage and um, paper. In this one on the right, it's a paper, large paper crane that he created. Um, that was part of the Do Something Org um, initiative, Paper Cranes for Japan. Um, in the aftermath in 2011, um, he worked along with this organization and the people in his studio to create this huge paper crane um, piece out of um, many, many <laughs> paper cranes and used a lot of um, uh, paper cranes made by the youth in New York. Um, the picture on the left, um, you can see some of his portraiture. Um, these, this is made, it's not out of trash, but it's out of sugar. Um, and it's uh, some of the portraits that he did with children um, in the Caribbean. Um, it's called sugar, um, it's part of the Sugar Children series. This is his Valentina the Fastest. Um, and you'll see more in the next slide of how he goes from this portraiture and this work into his work with garbage. Um, so Vic Munez, there's a, there's a entire documentary about um, Vic Munez called Wasteland. Um, if you guys are looking for something to watch, it's great. Um, so Vic goes from New York to his native Brazil, and he goes to the largest um, to the largest garbage garbage dump outside of Rio, um, and is Jardim Gramaco, and he takes this from, so from 2008 to 2009, he goes and he's like, uh, they, they basically um, take, he goes to the garbage facility and he's like, I'm gonna make these portraits. And so you can see some of these portraits in kind of this kind of 2D uh, aesthetic. Um, and so what ends up happening is he ends up basically interviewing the waste and municipal workers. He basically, talks to them and then he's able to basically photograph them. And then along with the workers who are on site, they actually create these portraits on site. Um, and then they're beautifully photographed. So here we have, there's the gypsy, Irma the, Irma the bearer, uh, mother and children. Um, and on the right, we have women ironing. So you can kind of see the way that he takes from, from his photos or like from other works of art and, you know, and makes it into his own. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about community-based um, artists. Um, right now I'm actually outside of East Jesus or Slab City, I'm over in Bombay Beach. Um, I think that it's interesting for communities like this. Um, East Jesus is an experimental habitable, extensive artwork in progress. Um, <laughs> they, uh, They've been gathering or been assembling in East Jesus, or people and artists and artisans have been assembling in East Jesus since 2006. Um, it was started by Charles Stephen Russell um, in Slab City. Um, and the inhabitants of East Jesus um, and offsite members provide basically this 
refuge for artists and musicians and survivalists, but mostly they're extremely dedicated to providing a working model of improbable or improvised community. And not only do they make artwork and beautiful artworks out of trash, but they also live almost entirely off grid using solar power. Um, to the left, we have kind of this woolly mammoth that's made out of tires and repurposed um, uh, plastics. Oh, sorry. And then over here to the right, we have an abandoned plane. Um, and then right side, a few miles away from there, uh, where I am, which is in Bombay Beach, um, is an artist, basically an old, it's like an artist collective kind of town where people are and inhabit and um, create beautiful works of art. So here on the left, we have one of the opera house um, homes that are here in um, here in Bombay Beach. Um, and you can see there are, it's uh, sandals that are all inside repurposed. And then there's mattresses that are framing these uh, prints right here. Um, to the right, we have Lodestar, which is by the artist Randy Palumbo. Um, it's beautiful at night. It uses a lot of mirror and obviously repurposed metals. Um, where I'm talking right now is right inside the Be Back Gallery, uh, the Bombay Beach uh, Artist Collective. Um, and this piece is called Da Vinci Fish, which is by Sean Guerrero, Royce Carlson, Nina Carlson, John Murphy, Jay Cope, and Greg Hillig. And they collaborated to make basically this rotating, beautiful um, Da Vinci fish or this large airplane fish, um, which they were able to like laser cut. And there's tin, there's like tin bits and like tin can tops as scales and mirrors. And yeah, it's really great. And then there's also some other, you can see there's other um, repurposed and like wood pieces here in the foreground. Um, this piece is one of the houses that was transformed for the Bombay Beach Biennale, um, which was an artist, artist event that was started here um, probably about three or four years ago. And this is one of, um, it's an LA artist, Kenny Scharf, um, who created, he's more of a graffiti artist, known for his graffiti work, um, but he made an assemblage piece here um, on the side of one of the buildings where he collected all these kid toy cars and then did some of his work, um, his little one-eyed, two-eyed monsters um, on top of it. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about kind of the environmental awareness and art and how those come together. Um, so as most of you are probably from the Bay Area, uh, this is the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium's blue whale art installation that was on Chrissy Field in 2018. Um, this piece was um, was led by artist Joel Stockdale and Justin Selenkova. Um, so this idea of the actual whale, before I get into how it was made, um, started basically from the whale that washed up on the Marin County shores in 2017. Um, the whale that washed up on that shore was 79, I believe, 79 feet long. And so the artist decided, it's basically spurred a discussion with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and with the Artist Council to basically like create a piece of work that would be even more monumental to therefore like show more impact of what's going on and like bring awareness to this. So the actual piece that they made ended up being 82 feet. Uh, this is a more in progress photo so you can see a little bit more of kind of the underbelly of the whale. Um, this entire whale is um, besides the framing the outside skin part is made of 100% post consumer recycled HDPE plastic which is high density polyethylene. Um, HDPE PE, if you don't know are basically laundry detergent bottles, shampoo bottles, juice containers, uh, milk jugs and trash cans. Um, so actually trash cans was one of the largest um, HDPE that they actually used for this project. A lot of, you can tell like a lot of blues, um, uh, blue recycle bins and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so what they actually did to create the patterns of the scales in the fish um, is they melted down 
all of this HDPD PE plastic and they made them into these bricks. So basically they made these like panels in which they could wrap and wrap around the metal framing for the whale. It's a very interesting way. It, there's a bit of off casting that happens when you do that. So if any of you guys are trying to maybe do some of that, please be careful. Um, but because the, but with melting the plastics and using all these plastics in a different way, you're able to cr basically create this almost like a mosaic, which is really beautiful. Um, as you can see as in the tail before there. Oh, um, so similar, I think it's interesting that when one, when, when one artist comes around or there's some kind of, you know, uh, an impact of things that are happening, someone else starts something at the same time. So across on the other side of the world in Bruges, um, there was a studio group, K, uh, Studio KCA, who actually created a um, 10,000 pound whale made out of plastic. Um, this is a little bit different in that it's a, you can see kind of the outlines of exactly what they used in the plastic. Um, instead of in the previous example where they melted everything down into panels. Um, approximately five tons of the plastic that was used for this actual piece were pulled directly from the Pacific and Atlantic oceans. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting way instead of taking donations, this was a way that they actually scavenged and like took plastic outside <clears throat> out of the oceans um, and then to bring awareness like for, um, for the people of Bruges. Uh, I had the I had the pleasure of talking to um, the next artist, E. Tyler Burton, um, in her uh, Palm Springs studio the other day. Um, she uses plastic or in a different way, brings awareness in a different way. And I like to use these two examples. On the left, she has uh, fossils of the future using canotypes, which is, um, if you don't know, is a process in which you use uh, photoresistant um, chemicals onto paper, and then you put uh, either like plastic or something in the sun, and it basically creates the negative space. So in this, in this, she had like put over multiple layers of plastics and things like that, and then created these beautiful um, fossil looking um, pieces. And here into the middle, we have polyparfait and thirst, um, which are two structures of like kind of a mini small or large monolith um, that create, that has layers of plastics and resins and um, actual imprints, something that you would maybe think of as like um, an archaic or something um, that you would find on a dig. Um, Next person I'm going to talk about is Angela Hassel, Hasseltein PZ. Um, she is the woman in charge <laughs> for uh, the nonprofit Washed Ashore. Uh, she started this nonprofit in her native Oregon um, after she would go on long walks and see all the plastic. And basically she collected all the plastic on her shores and wanted to bring awareness to all the plastic that was, that was being collected. Um, from our shores and she started um, basically making just large uh, sculptures of, of animals that were affected by plastic pollution. Um, she has, I think it was in 2007, 2016, she created along with um, her volunteers and her team, 17 large sculptures that were acquired by the Smithsonian. Um, you can see those on their website for Washed Ashore. Um, she actually has a, uh, well, Washed Ashore has an exhibit that will be at, exhibiting at the Oakland Zoo um, in 2021, if um, or when um, we're able to go and see that or when it reopens, you should definitely go and see some of that work in person. Um, another woman who also started another um, plastic awareness um, nonprofit is Diana Cohen. Diana Cohen founded the Plastic Pollution, uh, Pollution Coalition. Um, but I'd like to feature a little bit of her work too. I think it's important to see how artists can also be leaders as well. And it's kind of interesting to see the way in the role changes. 
over time. So Diana Cohen started um, making these beautiful, uh, basically plastic textiles. And so she used something a little bit differently than we had in the previous examples, which were uh, basically reforming into uh, like flat slabs of plastic. Um, in here, there's a softness um, to her work. Um, so in this way, I, uh, she used a lot of uh, plastic bags or um, thin plastics and used uh, heating elements to basically melt them together. Um, so uh, just a quick thing from the from a sidestep from the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, they just recently put forth um, a US presidential plastics action. Um, Present, uh, proposed plan. Um, it was, I think it's over 500 or uh, 1200 members of the Plastic Coalition have come together um, to talk about um, things that the Biden administration should focus on um, in the presidency. Um, so uh, this is just a quick plug for that. They have a small petition. They have a petition going around and you can see that at plasticfreepresident.org. Um, and this is just bringing to air or to light, basically the purchasing power of the federal government to eliminate single use plastic items and replace them with reusable products. Um, hopefully to update existing federal regulations um, and to stop subsidizing plastic producers. Um, so please go on there more. I'm not gonna talk too much about it today, but I thought it was pretty important to bring up still. Um, so Diana Cohen also, um, as an artist and an activist, um, was part of the Art and Embassies program. Um, so the Art and Embassies program, um, which is part of the US Department of State, um, basically take artists um, and they put, them, put their artwork in US embassies across the world. Um, hers is in Poland. And so here she is giving a talk about um, probably the, uh, probably her organization. And here she is talking about fish. Um, and there's another artist that I like to talk about, which is Bible Brevet. And he used, um, he used more of an archaic approach. And this is where I think is a little bit more guerrilla style in his, in his work, um, which is a, it's a constitution to go. Um, in this piece, uh, he had basically took a consumerist printing, uh, archetypal like consumerist printing me mechanism, which is a receipt printer, and he programmed it to print one of the most important um, pieces of documentation in US history. Um, so I'm going to play that really quick for you because. So even though it's something that is taking a little different approach, it's, I think it's more of like, we have to remember that also the devices that we're using are becoming archaic and becoming trash as well. And how we can kind of like reprogram them to kind of fit within our, um, our society. So another artist I'm gonna highlight again is, uh, or highlight is Jonathan Callen. Um, so Jonathan Callen uh, uses, uh, books in his work, clearly. Um, and he has the piece on the left being unfair and the one on right, the library of past choices. Um, and the, uh, Cohen, Kellen, he took, I think he has like a, he was an avid book collector. And so he started collecting them and then he was trying to figure out a new way of using them within his work. And I think this is kind of a common thread that I find through a lot of artists is that you start collecting or you're drawn to certain mediums. And because of that, they start showing up in your work. Um, and so um, as a scholar, I believe that Callan used, um, you know, he figured that these pieces were no longer, you know, a second-hand or carrier of information. The text was turned, you know, more into the object um, of first experience. So he worked to basically, and I think this is what a lot, we see a lot with, um, with artists using different materials and a lot of one material is that it starts kind of eliminating the material. And we start not reading basically in this way, we read, we dissolve basically the text and we just start seeing these shapes and we see kind of more of what the objectivity of the, of the pieces. 
Um, in this piece, he actually glues all of the papers together and then screws um, it. So it basically makes it into kind of like a bent shape. And then he and then he screws them all together. So the end result ends up kind of looking like almost like a like a tree trunk, um, which is kind of full circle of the, the entire um, piece of of paper paper production. Um, another artist, a Guinean artist, um, is El Anetsui. Um, El Anetsui um, is has I mean, he has his work in permanent collections all across the world. Um, he has one in the De Young Museum on the second floor. Um, but um, El Anetsui started working originally with clay and wood. Um, but as he was moving around, he found um, that there was all of these alcohol bottle caps everywhere. Um, and so he started going to alcohol recycling facilities and gathering bottle caps, and then he would hammer them down and basically string them together with other aluminum and metal wires and basically create these beautiful textiles and these beautiful like pieces. Um, so this is a piece that he had that I saw um, at the Venice Biennale this last year. Um, this is one section of a very large um, installation. You can see how the bottle caps like have basically this kind of reflective and tactile quality. Um, here um, we have another piece called Trova. Um, these this Trova is a little bit more uh, it more represents kind of, or looks more like a traditional kente cloth. Um, another artist, uh, Willie Cole. Um, Willie Cole works with um, a lot of different um, recyclable materials. Um, but the first one that I love that, of his work um, is his work with plastic bottles. Um, and this is Ascension. So this piece was made in 2016. Um, and the entirety of the piece, like the width of the entire piece is 25 feet. Um, I love the undulating way of using the, of using the plastic bottles and kind of creating this kind of almost like manta feeling. Um, but Willie Cole is really known for is, um, is shoe installations or his shoe pieces. Um, so he actually was drawn to shoes uh, because of his son. So um, I think when his son was 12 years old, uh, his son <laughs> brought him into his studio, a collection of a bunch of sneakers that he had held together. So that's kind of where his first sculpture came from was assembling all of these shoes that his son had given him. Going forward, he started making, um, as you can see, masks that kind of draw from the African heritage. And he started making um, these uh, blossoms. On the right is a, one of the blossoms. Um, what he found in his research, research is with shoes and using them is that women's shoes are the number one um, shoe, that <laughs> the most prominent shoe um, in Goodwills. And so actually he was, I think for the first, his first shoe show or show that he had with making shoes, he actually got acquired all of his shoes um, from two Goodwills in Atlanta um, for only 50 cents a pound. Um, so another like section of, so you can see more shoes as his shoe, as they went from masks and then we had these beautiful representations of flowers and blossoms. Um, then it starts going into, he starts going into furniture, like starting creating these, um, these thrones. So this is part of the throne series. Um, and I, it's an interesting uh, bit of what he, Willie thinks is that, you know, I feel like he is able to use something that's just so consumerist, which is, you know, these, you know, these shoes and um, especially like high heeled shoes and dress shoes, things that are held to this kind of, you know, like very expensive quality. Um, and then use kind of in this kind of more, you know, assemblage, almost kind of bric-a-brac kind of way, <laughs> or at least kind of maybe people think a little gaudy. Um, so now that we're talking a little bit about furniture, I'm going to talk about um, these two uh, clothing works. Um, so there was these, so on the left, um, Harry Nurev and, um, and the fashion company Balenciaga created um, a sofa made out of all of their, um, their old clothing. Um, they basically housed it in, um, 
in PE foil, um, which is the same on the right, which is just a polyethylene foil, a clear plastic, um, and use that as, um, as upholstery. Um, the, uh, it, the one on the right, 2011, um, is a uh, design by the studio Altelier Blage. It's called Ploff, <laughs> um, but it was a, a way for them to, um, to complete uh, or to basically show off um, the way to use um, plastic, oh, not plastic weight, sorry. Uh, the basically a way to take, uh, to take clothing waste and, um, uh, and recycle the textile leftovers um, to shred and shred them down. So here we have like on the right, we have the shredded down textiles and on the left, it's a little bit more um, visual, like it's like kind of more like they want people to see what the brand is like in that piece. Um, I think it's interesting that even just a few years ago, um, there's probably about 12,000, like 13,000 tons of clothing that are um, generated in the US um, and only 9,000 tons of it um, are actually landfilled. So um, I feel like fast fashion and things like that are really a detriment to society. So this is a very interesting way of repurposing um, clothing and textile waste. Um, and we're gonna move to a little bit to styrofoam. So the left, um, the piece on the left is called Trash Former. Um, and it was uh, pieced together by the Greek designer Savaz Laws. Um, he uses styrofoam packaging um, to create a sculptural chair, this blue chair um, that was made to raise awareness about packaging waste. Um, as you can see, kind of the shapes for it, I'm sure you've had some kind of Amazon packaging or something that goes to that effect. Um, I love it because I think it looks a little bit like Legos. Um, the one on the right is um, a chair and table design um, XL poly table and 18 scrap poly chairs uh, as a project by Max Lamb, um, who is a designer and maker who basically took a huge block of, um, of styrofoam and then created, first he created the full table and then he took, um, the, he used a foam wire cutter, a hot knife. Um, and then from all of the scrap, he was able to create all of the chairs that went along with it. Um, even though he used something that was not recyclable um, in the beginning, I think that's a really interesting way to think about designing furniture for the future um, and how we can basically make composite blocks and then be able to like take apart what we need um, and design around that way. Um, if anyone was interested, <laughs> there is such thing called a styrofoam densifier, which basically creates um, styrofoam blocks um, or tubes from, uh, from your styrofoam. Um, I actually have a, um, in one of the next slides, I have a, a Bay Area, um, a Bay Area company that takes styrofoam donations. If you were ever wondered like where your styrofoam can go and it can actually be repurposed and re-extruded. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about building. Um, so there's been some really great plastic design competitions. Um, this one uh, is Temple of Trash, which was um, made by Salig Design um, in which they basically bundled all of these PET plastics into a huge temple and just used basically scaffolding. Um, I think it, it's interesting using this kind of like bailing um, idea around making this temple. Um, I can see a lot of things in the future maybe going from these like uh, basically bailing and building blocks and using ways like that, building materials like that and basically using it to create structures. Um, I'm only gonna touch a little bit about this but I can't talk about building with trash without talking about Michael Reynolds. Um, Michael Reynolds um, was an architect and designer and builder, and he obtained the patent for building with blocks of cans um, in 1973. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but if you have um, 
if you have any questions or I should definitely see a question about Michael Reynolds and his Earthship Biodexter, you should definitely watch Garbage Warrior, um, which came out in 2005. Um, I understand that I'm going a little bit over, so I'm going to try to kind of cut this a little bit short. So I'm just going to be brief. Um, uh, this is a section made by Brooks and Scarpa Architects in Santa Monica, a contemporary build where they use the first floor um, of design and basically used it for housing blocks. Um, this is more tire building and cob structures um, from Michael Reynolds. Also the way that people are using tires and things like that for um, other, other built structures throughout the US. All right, guys. Um, so that is the end of my talk. Thank you for sticking around. Um, and I hope you learned something um, and hopefully were inspired by something you saw today. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Kate. Wow. I'm really inspired. That was just like, it was like so many different ways to use trash from like buildings to furniture to just art. Very, very cool. So now is our question and um, Q&A section. So does anyone have any questions? You can either uh, type it in the chat box or go ahead and unmute yourself. Just know that we're recording this and we'll be putting it up on YouTube. So um, yeah, just know that if you decide to speak. Any questions? I don't have any questions. I just want to say I loved it. Oh. I'm just thank you for doing all that research. Oh. And, um, you know, in the beginning, I thought, oh, this is going to be everybody we know. No, <laughs> and three quarters of it. I never heard of half of these people. So thank you for doing all that. And maybe I'll even invite you to come and give that talk to our class. Oh, yeah. Well, that I mean, that means a lot, Andre, because you know a lot about um, environmental artists. So. Yeah, but the, the important thing is that there's so much more going on and this kind of thing really introduces us to the stuff that, you know, um, I can't, I don't have time to research all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot. And there's, you know, there's always so much more happening. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Mike. Thank you for sticking around, Andre. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm muting, unmuting. Thank you, Kate. I thought it was really great. All right. Totally learned about new artists I didn't know about. Appreciate it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Do you, um, with your own work, I know you were working in styrofoam mm -hmm. to make those chairs. Um, what are, what's the next step for you? Are you continuing to work in styrofoam to do more furniture, sculptural work, or have you been inspired to move in a different direction? I've been collecting a lot of styrofoam, actually. Um, I collected a bunch uh, from West Oakland, where I usually am, um, and a lot of styrofoam from, um, from buildings that are being torn down. Um, I'm going to try to make, make a series of different types of furniture made out of different types of, of styrofoam. Um, there's, you know, like R13 and R12 and um, uh, blue and purple and all different types of um, types of foam. And um, honestly, what I really started to do with styrofoam that I thought was interesting is um, on my bike rides or on my runs throughout the Bay, um, I would pick up and I would make assemblage sculptures from styrofoam that I would pick out of the Bay. Um, and I would like assemble them and then leave them on piers. Um, to just show like how much because I it's like once you see it now if you ever look there's like small like blue styrofoam balls that like wash up on the bay and all sorts of things so um yeah hopefully maybe something that's all of those things combined and I pull all the styrofoam out Kate could you say more about um the building you showed where the, the bottom floor was made out of plastic bottles like how were oh, they it was made out of, made out of cans cans oh. cans it made out, it was made out of press cans um and i think that was only like one or two years ago um which i thought was pretty interesting um because i know in the past building with uh with cans um 
it, they usually fill the cans mm -hmm. um, and that creates a lot of problems. Um, I know that there was, um, there was a building that collapsed because people were using some of that, like using cans and filling them with, instead of using um, regular insulation and other kind of building materials. Um, but yeah, that's the first example that I've ever seen of not like a whole place, but of the first floor of kind of more of a commercial building. Um, I just started researching um, that duo, but um, yeah. And what, what was the name of the person doing that or the architect? Um, I believe it's Salig and let me find the other name. Oh, it was Brooks and Scarpa Architects, and that's in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, Kate, do you have a particular project you're working on in Bombay Beach? Oh, good question, Tyler. <laughs> um, I just started thinking about, and I think I just told you about it, um, about a performance piece. Um, I do a lot of paintings that have to deal with um, form and body. And um, I was just thinking about making one um, where I take the canvas and I drag it into Bombay, Bombay Beach, the Salton Sea, and then take um, kind of the clay of the bottom of the sea and then use it in performance to basically like cover the canvas in the way that I usually do with, um, with aerosol. Um, and so I'm really excited about that actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> Kate, Tyler is the person I wanted you to meet. <laughs> well, guess what? I met her. Yeah. <laughs> I tell her. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Do we have any more questions? Any final questions? <laughs> Let's watch it again. Yeah. Oh no, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it will be up afterwards um, on the Weed website, mm -hmm. uh, weedartists.org, and it will also be on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Let's remind folks that that if they really like this, they could donate. Yes, if you liked anything that you saw, please donate to Weed Artists, mm -hmm. weedartists.org. Mm -hmm. And yes, so thank you everyone for coming. Kate, that was a wonderful presentation. And we'll be having this up in a couple of days on our YouTube channel. Um, so go ahead and, and subscribe to our YouTube. It's um, if you type in weed artists, it'll pop up. And we will also have it on our website once it's uploaded to YouTube. Uh, you can check out here our upcoming weed live stream events on February 11th. We're having our arts and healing event on our Instagram live and it's um desi soleil will be doing uh, a meditation called the new paradigm shift quantum alchemy and Ange angelic energies and on february 21st we're doing our third episode of arts and activism collaborating with natural forces a presentation by stacy levy and on february 27th we're having our traces um membership exhibition online opening so keep an eye out for our, our February newsletter and uh, we hope to see you again at a future weed live stream event. Thank you so much and have a really great rest of your evening. Hi and thank you everyone for thank you. with me and listening to me talk. <laughs>